Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're not sure if YouTube's updating, so hopefully you guys can hear. Um, <clears throat> we don't have anybody else in the Google Hangout yet, so nonetheless, we're going to go forward. So um, anyway, to get started, we just wanted to give a little overview of what we're going to talk about tonight, and uh, this will all be recorded, of course, so if uh, we run into anything, hopefully we can uh, edit that out or, or get onto uh, YouTube and fix that. So um, we're going to talk about some midges and tie some midges and, uh, and then maybe at the end answer some questions as they come up. So if any of you are on the YouTube event and you want to see the live uh, Google Hangout, you just go to Hangouts and search for me, Curtis Fry, and... Um, you should see a uh, Hangout invitation, and you could uh, log into it there, so you should be okay. Um, anyway, so we're going to go ahead and start with the brief two-hour presentation. Now, we just got a few slides here is all. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go start off with just an overview of what midges are, are uh, doing here. Um, and... We're, we're going to talk about midges in terms of rivers and lakes. So, you know, if you're, if you're mostly a river guy or mostly a lake guy, this really applies to both because it's, it's the same animal, just a different size and kind of different presentation. So we're going to talk mostly on the fly tying aspect of it all. Um, as a lot of people know, midges are pretty important when it comes to trout. Um, they're all over the place. Pretty much any body of water is going to have midges. And these are the, you know, they kind of look like mosquitoes, but they don't bite. Um, from the order Diptera, and so they've got two wings that go along, back along their backs, and we'll, we'll get into some pictures here in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the trout eat a lot, and a lot of lakes that I know of, that, I mean, that's like an exclusive thing in the spring. So it's important to, to be able to tie and fish these. So when we're talking midges, uh, you know, most of the time you're going to see three different um, areas. Uh, number one, We'll, we'll uh, talk about some bloodworms, some larvae, and those are going to be important in lakes more than anything, but also understand that uh, the same thing applies in rivers. You're going to find bloodworms in rivers, so that's why things like your uh, San Juan worms are going to work and that sort of thing. So they're not, San Juan worms not necessarily a worm worm, it's, a, it's more of a coronamid larva or a midge larva. And then uh, pupas, which is after they start to uh, progress and, and, and migrate towards the surface, and then emerge in it as an adult. And they're going to emerge once they hit the surface, break out of that shock, and then uh, fly away, do their thing, mate, and some of them come back. Um, but we're going to focus on these stages here. First off being blood mid bloodworms. <clears throat> One thing, biggest thing to understand with them is that they're living in the mud and the sediment uh, on the bottom of the water. So when I fish bloodworms, especially on still water, I'm fishing those in the spring. And I'm fishing pretty close to the bottom because uh, they're at, in that form. They're not. They're not going to be found much higher in the water column, typically speaking. Now, in rivers, you may find them because they're going to get dislodged, and and who knows where they'll end up. But uh, they will, they'll be down there on the bottom most of the time. Uh, another thing that's kind of cool is that you'll often see in lakes. You'll see this as uh, bloodworms and these larvae will migrate from deeper, cooler water to the warmer water, and uh, a lot of times when that happens, you'll actually see fish aggressively taking bloodworms. Again, it's going to be close to the bottom type of thing. Uh, just got to dial in the depth of the water you're fishing. A uh, couple things to keep in mind for tying, we'll show you on a couple of patterns tonight, is <clears throat> they've got some red color in their bodies because of hemoglobin. By and large, they're red, but you'll see some green. Uh, you may also see some tan hues. And they're going to have a distinct segmented body. And then when uh, we're talking sizes, they're going to be a larger size than pupa or adults, typically speaking. And they'll kind of go down by a factor of a couple of fly sizes. If you've got a 10 on a bloodworm, then you're going to use a 12 for a pupa and then maybe a 14 for an adult kind of a thing. So in terms of pupa, we'll, we focus a lot on pupa. In fact, probably most of your midge fishing is going to be on a pupa. And I'll lump emergers into that. And they're going to be in a lot of different shades, shapes, colors, and sizes. It's important to pay attention to the sizes, especially uh, when you're 
in areas that have multiple uh, uh, broods of, of bugs because you may see some bigger flies hatching that mask the hatch of kind of the smaller ones. So you have to pay attention to what the fish are feeding. Um, typically speaking, in, especially in lakes where there's no uh, current, they're going to move very slowly. They do wiggle, and so sometimes you have to adjust your retrieve or lack of retrieve for that. In terms of the tying aspect, a lot of different colors, like I said, black, silver, um, you've got red ribbing with black, you've got some silver ribbing. If they're silver, again, that they, when, they, when they go to, to uh, pupate and go to the surface, they have to uh, use gases trapped in their exoskeleton to rise. And so that effect will actually create kind of a silver, um, open, you know, pearlescent type effect. So that's why you'll see some things like the chromie come in silver. But also understand there's olives, greens, reds, browns, um, <clears throat> a lot of different colors. So it's a good idea to pay attention to what you're seeing on the water. Um, they have a very distinct tapered body with a relatively bulbous head. That's in relation to the rest of the body. You're going to see uh, in the pupa white gills. In the larger sizes, those can be fairly pronounced. Maybe on smaller patterns, maybe not such a big deal. And then you'll also see wing pads. And the wing pads, uh, those are the uh, the wings starting to form. And well, they're formed. They're just starting to to get a little bigger to bust out of the exoskeleton. And so those can be pronounced. And just in, in in our experience, when you're dealing with smaller sizes, it's best to stick to a simple uh, imitation as to as opposed to throwing a bunch of stuff on there. Here's some pictures. Uh, we've got a, a number of different pupa. You can see, uh, hopefully, based on the pictures here with colors, different sizes, partially some different shapes. If you notice the upper right-hand corner one, those uh, don't have as uh, pronounced um, uh, head necessarily as maybe the one on the left. Uh, and then the ones on the bottom, right, they also have the ring wing pads. And you can see there's kind of some silverish gray color to them. And so it's important uh, with most of your midge patterns that you've got that distinct segmentation. Now, <clears throat> we will we'll talk a lot about emergers, and, and emergers are going to be very important for you, uh, whether you're fishing on the river or in a lake. But that's when the pupa is going to bust out of that exoskeleton and begin to come out as an adult. In that phase, a lot of times they'll... Uh, have a, a vertical orientation, although sometimes they'll actually hit the water at a, at a horizontal as they wiggle, um, but, but ultimately they have to get out of that shuck and uh, get onto the surface. The, when, when we're fishing rivers, I have found, at least for me, and we'll, we'll show this in a couple of the patterns, is that you want to tie a vertical-ish oriented pattern. Um, and, and so you'll want something that floats in the surface film, not on it. And all, a lot of times when you see fish rising, especially during a midge hatch at the beginning, what you see is probably not an adult being taken. It's probably a pupa emerging. And so if you're experiencing a hatch, you'll want to first focus on that phase because if you throw an adult, they're not going to hit it at, as much. You may get a few, but uh, stick to those pupa patterns. Adults will come into play, and you know I've had times where I've, been fishing a midge hatch from very beginning to end over you know two three four hours, and you know I'll tell you when they switch to the adults they all ignore the pupa so you have to really pay attention to that. How to identify them? They look like mosquitoes and they come in all shapes and sizes and colors, and so um, pay attention to what the colors of the adults are, and again remember the size will um, scale down again from the larva. And, but that doesn't mean they're going to be super small. I mean, we do fish 32s, but you can go up to, I, I've got some size 8 and 10 adults that I've used, whether it's for a cluster or, uh, or an adult itself that's that big. They're, they do get that big. And so, like I said, in the, the one uh, point there, they do cluster a lot, and so the fish can target those. gives them a little bit more bang for the buck. Uh, when it comes to tying, they are very high-floating. You know, the, the adults, once they hatch, they're not going to very easily be able to penetrate the water, so you'll see them kind of skate on the surface. And then again, they still have that segmented tapered body. And colors, they're just all over the place. So obviously your blacks and browns and olives will be good, but 
I, I saw one this year that was a bright green, and that's what they were keying on. Uh, they wouldn't take the blacks. So as far as fly patterns go, we're going to spend most of our time tonight going over uh, some tutorials, and a lot of these are on our website already. Some are actually in a, on our YouTube channel. Uh, but nonetheless, we're going to go through with a little bit of explanation on them, and here's a few of them that we'll tie. If we have time at the end, we, uh, we'll, we'll take some questions, if we can get people logged in there and asking questions. And then, um, again, like I said, this will be recorded. So with that said, we're going to start off here, and Cheech is going to start. How's everybody doing? I'm uh, I'm the tying mule tonight, so Curtis is going to be running the uh, electrical audio visual junk, and I'm going to run the bikes. Anyway, we're going to start out tying basically a Griffiths nap. Um, if you guys have followed the blog, you know about my crazy uncle Ken, who thinks he invented a Griffiths nap, and he calls it the Peacock King. So ever since then, I've started calling this fly the Peacock King. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, what I've got in the vise right now is is an Allen Fly Fishing N103S, basically a straight eye hook, um, similar to the Tiemco 101. And the flies that we're going to be tying, I think the smallest we'll go due to the, the camera and live streaming is is a 16. So you're going to have to just imagine these flies smaller and we'll do the best we can to adjust them for proportion. Um, using uni 8 dot thread, this is just black. And as you see I'm just start kind of in the middle. Um, I've taken some Antron and this isn't the full uh, the full piece of yarn. This is about how thick the full yarn is. So I've just stripped off uh, about a third of that for this fly. So um, I'm just going to tie this in right here, just like that, and wrap it all the way back. And midges don't have a tail, uh, but there there is a shuck. And this is even a cluster pattern, so I don't even know if this represents anything. It just kind of gives it a little bit of sheen on the water. And I'm going to trim that roughly the length of the body. It wouldn't even hurt if it was a little bit shorter. Um, the next thing is I'm going to take a piece of saddle hackle. This is a piece of grizzly saddle hackle from Whiting. Um, and so there are times where I'll take a piece of hackle that's maybe one size smaller than the actual fly that I'm tying. And uh, so anyway, I'm just going to take that. And when I tie it in, I'm going to leave a little bit, maybe like a sixteenth of an inch of stem hanging out the back of it. And that will help when I start wrapping this hackle forward. Another thing is, uh, as I have it tied in now, the shiny side of the hackle is facing the camera and the dull side of the hackle is facing me. That way, when I start wrapping the hackle forward, the fibers will curve toward the back. If you don't do that, then it, it will cause the fibers to go over the eye and then you'll trap them. Um, the next step is to choose some peacock. Um, I'm going to take some peacock uh, fibers, some peacock curl fibers, right from the eye. So um, you guys who have tied a lot, you've probably seen that uh, when you're tying with peacock, not all peacock is, is made equally. And uh, so some peacock has really long filaments, other peacock's really short. So you kind of have to size your peacock almost like you do hackle. Anyway, I'm going to take two pieces of it off, and I'm going to tie those two pieces in by the butts. And I'm going to wrap back almost to the bend of the hook, and then advance my thread forward. And then I'm going to take these pieces of peacock, and because we're... Uh, using a camera that kind of restricts the movement here, I'm going to use the rotary feature of my vise to wrap these forward. You see what it did there? There's not a lot of filaments there. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to back that off, and I'm going to retie that in so that 
I tie it in further up the the hurl. These are the edits that you guys don't see in our videos. Nobody's perfect. Okay, so I've got those tied in. See how nice that peacock comes off? That's that's what you get when you're uh, taking it from the eye. Now I'm leaving a little bit of space at the eye of the hook. And I'll just tie that off. With peacock, if you just grab it and pull it, it will come right off. Uh, you don't need to get your scissors in there. And then I'm just going to take my hackle. And as I wrap this, i got to make sure that, that it starts wrapping with the shiny side facing the front of the fly. Once I get that about where I want it to go, I'm just going to use my rotary feature again and wrap all the way to the front, and then I'm going to tie off. You notice when I tie off, I'm only using a couple wraps. So that's pretty much the fly. I'm just going to whip finish it. And this represents... Um, several adult midges that are that are clumping together. So again this is a midge cluster. I call it the peacock king. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, but we all know it's just a Griffith's gnat with a tail. Now you see on this tail I can even get in there and kind of you know trim some of those off to make it a little bit more buggy. So it's not like a rough end, maybe thin it out a little bit. But anyway, that is the peacock king. Curtis loves the fish this pattern too. <laughs> yeah, we got Jerry, I see you on the hangout. I think anybody else who's wanting to jump, oh, there he goes, Jerry. But uh, we're getting a few people getting the hang of hangouts. It's uh, <clears throat> not quite as easy as YouTube to get in, but it is posted on our Google, uh, or on my Google plus profile, that's Curtis Fry, um, and you have to be in my circle first, but uh, you should be able to join. Yeah, if you guys get in on Google Hangouts, you can talk to us during this, you can ask questions, uh, you can do any of that kind of stuff, so feel free. All right. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, we're going to switch horses here. This pattern uh, is the gut bomb. It's uh, this is one that we kind of developed out of... Uh, Stop bumping the ta table, jeez. Oh, I'm trying to focus now. Uh, we developed this one out of, a, out, of, out, of, out of a need to have a good blood uh, midge larva, blood worm. Looking good there. Okay. So, to start off on this one, um, this is a C49S. This is a size 8. And you can use, you know, whatever hook you want. But it's, I want it to be a little heavier because it's going to sink. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start, and I dress the hook because I want this under body to show. And so just wrapping turns. One of the reasons I keep the uh, tag end here like this is that it helps control the wraps to make sure they're touching. As I touch the camera there. Mm -hmm. Now we get down to the end, and I can trim that. And really, this only consists of two materials. There's some crystal flash, and some uh, you can use rainy stretch flex, or you can use this scud back from Hairline. 
So I just have some midge flash. It's a root beer color. I'm going to tie that in there right at the end. And secure that. And then the scud back, this is a, the eighth inch or the stretch flex, whichever you prefer. And I don't need very much of it. One thing I like to do is I like to take that and cut a little bit of an angle. Helps you to tie it in there at that tie-in point. And then I, after I have that tied in, I'm going to work my way back, stretching it out a little to meet down to where that is going to be tied. And then covering up that and work my way back up. And the thing is you want to just cover the, the hook shank there in black. And now I'm going to take the uh, scud back and I'm just going to create a segmented body. What you want to do here is overlap half of each subsequent wrap. And so I'll just pull this down to about that point. that off. Make sure it's tied in there. <clears throat> and now I'm going to pull that tight. As you can see, Curtis got a manicure for this. <laughs> oh, crap, what were you doing? Changing uh, your oil? Excellent. Jeez. Yeah. Now I'm going to wrap up the uh, crystal flash. And again, just following the segmentation here, nothing fancy. that off. So when I first saw this fly, I was I got to this point and I'm like, okay, this is this is not like the fly that that I saw. So this is this represents the like the turd sack all the way through these blood worms. They kind of like a shrimp where you if you buy them and they don't deter the suckers, they have a black line down their back. So that's essentially what uh, what he's doing right now, and then he'll add the red later. Yeah, one of the things that you'll notice if you look at the naturals is they have a very distinct segmented body, and the uh, gut feces vein going down the middle. Okay, so that's basically all the tying that we'll do. Now, I, again, you can mix up the colors. So I'm going to take a green, and I'm just going to work that into the rear section here, create a little green section. And then I'm going to go on the top and the bottom with the red. And that will leave the middle to be the black poop vein. And then I'll do two coats of Clear Cure Goo Hydro. One thing I will say right now is uh, on the video, the, it's really hard to get red to come through. So as you do this at home, as, as you tie this fly, the red will be a lot more prominent, even though on the screen it looks kind of dark. There's the first coat, zap it with the light. And now I'm going to tag a little bit more red on the top and on the bottom. I think this gives it a little bit more 3D look and effect. And then just one 
final little coat. And I always make sure I hit the head with that so that it will stay put. Got new batteries in my Pro Light last night, so this thing should cure in no time. All right, there's our gut bomb. So what I'll do usually with this one is I'll fish it on the bottom, like on a lake, uh, a foot or two above the bottom, and then I'll have other flies above that. But uh, I was actually surprised. This one, this one fishes really well. It also fishes on rivers uh, really well. So again, anywhere there's midges, which is everywhere, uh, a fly like this is going to do wonders. And uh, give it a try. Okay, back to you. All right. All right. Come find it. Um. Okay, the next fly I'm going to tie is just a. Uh, an adult midge, um, pretty simple pattern, just a straightforward parachute pattern. A uh, couple reasons why I wanted to tie it, um, just to kind of show you how simple they can be, and also I have a pretty cool technique on tying parachute flies and how to get them to, to look just right. Um, I am going to be tying this next fly on the Allen Fly Fishing 102 or D102DL. And as you guys can see, this, I mean, this is a serious hook. I mean, I've tied on um, lots of different hooks on the Umpqua Competition Series. And when this is actually the first hook that I ordered from Allen, you guys probably know that we're, we're you know, we're kind of partnering up with Allen a little bit, but, but it's because they, they do put out a, a very high quality product. And this is the first hook that I ordered from them. <clears throat> and uh, man, this this thing, I've, I've caught a lot of fish on it. It's really sharp. And out of all the hooks that I've bought from, from Allen, this thing really, uh, I mean, I haven't had any, uh, any of these come in that have like been misshapen or anything like that. So anyway, this is a 16 uh, D102DL again. And so I'm going to do a parachute. A lot of guys, when they're doing parachutes, uh, they'll start out by tying the post in very first. And I don't necessarily like to do that. I like to wait uh, wait until I'm ready to, to tie on the post um, just because uh, it, it gives you more room on the, on the hook. Um, again, mid, adult midges don't have tails, but I'm going to add a shuck. Um, like Curtis was saying, midge, midges are most vulnerable when they're emergers, and so this is kind of like an emerger trying to uh, get rid of its shuck. But anyway, I'm going to tie in, just like on the, the Peacock King, I'm going to tie it back and just trim it maybe a little bit shorter than the body, just about like that. Now on the body for these flies, you can do a variety of different things. You can um, make a biop body, a quill body. You can um, wrap them with span flex. And I just like a pretty subtle rib on the body of my, my midges. So what I've got is I've got some ADOT uni thread in an iron gray color. Now this isn't going to be a huge difference from the black. But it's, it's enough, I think, just to create a, a very small difference in the segmentation. So I'm just going to wrap this forward and then back. When I get to the back of the hook, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin my bobbin counterclockwise. And what that will do is it will kind of flatten out the uni thread a little bit. Again, I'm using uh, ADOT black uni thread. And as I cover up all the the blank spots or the, the voids in this fly, with a flat thread it will kind of flatten out your body a little bit. It will make it easier to add, uh, make it easier to, to put the ribbing in there. 
Sorry, I keep hitting the camera with my bob, and I'm about two inches away from it. So. Okay, so we've got a couple little fibers hanging out. That's that's not a big deal. So hopefully this shows up the difference, but uh, I'm just going to get the focus there. Yeah, we're good. I'm just going to take the thread and uh, sorry about the adjustments on the camera here that we're trying to figure out. Anyway, I'm just going to make a very subtle rib on the fly. So you can see it's really not very much, but I, I think it's enough to make it a little bit of a difference. So anyway, it's about as simple of a body as you can get. Now I'm ready to tie in my, my parachute post. Um, one of my favorite materials to tie parachute posts out of is, is McFlylon. It's a, it's a polypropylene type yarn. Um, and you can see here, I've got a, that's the whole hank that I, that I pulled off. I'm going to split that in about half and use that to tie in my post. Okay, so got a little hank of hair. Now some people will take this and go under the fly like this and tie it in. Well, then you're you you have a problem with uh, the under section of of the fly where where your thorax is going to be. You've got a big old bulb of white under there. So basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay it parallel to the hook shank and give it. Four good wraps, four or five good wraps, and then pull those up together. Before I wrap these posts together, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in front of the post and really secure that. And that will make it so it won't spin as much. So I'm going to pull it straight up, and I'm going to start wrapping around the base of these. See how that pulls it all together? And the key here is to wrap up the post. Now this will take some practice, um, and one of the things is if your post isn't wrapping like that, it means that you don't you don't have enough fibers in your post. So it'll take some practice to get to where you can do that without any uh, any issues. So at this point, I'm ready to tie in my hackle. Um, when I do parachute flies, uh, when I tie in the hackle, I'm gonna tie it onto the hook shank and then I'm going to wrap the stem up the parachute. So when I do this I kind of I put it behind the, the shank of the hook closest to me and kind of hard to show with, with the video but the, the stem you can see how I've got it seated. And I'm just going to take my thread and catch it one time so I've, I've got that tied in. I'm going to pull it up a little bit so that my stem is just slightly... Let me do that again. My stem, or the, the, the hackle where I, where I start wrapping, should be slightly higher than the parachute post. Can you see that, Curtis? No, sir. Okay. So I'm going to give it a couple wraps here in front, and then I'm going to wrap this up. Now, the hackle is behind the parachute post. It's it's right in front of me. And the shiny side of the hackle is facing me. That way, when I pull it down like this, now the shiny side is facing down. If you do it with the dull side down, when you wrap your parachute, the fibers will point down. And when you go to tie off your fly, you're going to trap fibers. So, I'm going to trim that off. Um, I'm going to have to improvise a tiny little bit here because I did not bring any dubbing. Do you have any dubbing for this? So, he's yeah, he just pulls that in his belly button. So what I've got is I've got a little bit of rabbit that I'm clipped off. I'll see if I can dub that on instead. I make it float better. That looks bad. Okay. So typically I would do this with like black 
and I'm like just any fine and dry dubbing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap the base of my fly so you can see. Let me back that off. So there I've got some dubbing underneath the, the parachute post. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, my thread and make one wrap around the base of the post and let the thread hang behind the parachute post. Um, now this is the, the tricky part. Um, you can see that I'm not up by the eye, and I'm not going to tie off my hackle up by the eye. I'm actually going to tie it off right on the post. And instead of using a whip finish, I'm going to just tack it with some super glue to, to tie off the fly. But anyway, if I've tied in my, my hackle right, I should be able just to start wrapping this. And I'm going to wrap one wrap underneath the other. You see how nice that lays down? And I'm going to continue down to my thorax. And when I get down here, I can usually cram in two to three more wraps into a tight spot. So you can see that's a pretty pretty dense little parachute. I could probably wrap it three more times in there before I'd start getting fibers going everywhere. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my thread and I'm going to let's see if I can get this so you can see it better. I'm going to take my thread and I'm going to go underneath the parachute but on top of my hackle twice. Okay, so I'm tied off. And we have videos on our site that show this exact technique, even though Curtis is doing it with his hot dog fingers. But you can you can look at that technique all by itself if you want. So I'm just going to trim off my hackle. So you can see there's not a single... ...very uniform. So... Uh, I used to get really frustrated tying parachutes until I learned how to do that technique. And it's really helped me out. I, I really like tying parachutes now, and I think everybody likes fishing them. Okay, so now I'm going to tie off the fly. Um, not really. I'm just going to finish it. So I've got some Zappa Gap. You can use any kind of super glue you want. So you can you see that? Can you see that, Curtis? Mm -hmm. There's just a tiny bit on this bodkin that I have. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shove that bodkin right behind the parachute post. That's where my thread touched last. So I'm just going to rub that in and kind of go back and forth. That super glue will go up against that thread. And now all I'm going to do is come in here and trim this off. Now I've tied custom orders for a long time, and I've never had somebody tell me that one of my parachutes has fallen apart on me. Maybe it's because they're just not telling me. But it's a very durable way to do it. Now as far as the, the post height, if you really want to see it, you can trim it about here. If you want a little bit lower profile, you can trim down here. I'm about, I, I'm a trim right there kind of guy. So anyway, uh, again, very simple, uh, kind of a dull emerger type midge. This is a really good pattern when you know that the fish are sipping um, adult midges. So anyway, if you have any questions, feel free to jump on Google Hangouts and ask us. We've got uh, a couple spots on Google Hangouts left if people want to join. Do um, you want to talk about Hackle? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. There he is, folks. Oh. There's the beast. Yeah, I am a beast. Let's focus the beast. I uh, groomed myself for this. Okay. Um, are we good? Yep. Nice up. All right. Um, one of the things that I wanted to go over real quick is hackle. You know, we've gotten a lot of questions. Well, what about this kind of hackle or that kind of hackle or this brand or that brand? Um, my opinion, and this is my opinion only, but whiting hackle is really hard to beat. Um, number one reason is because they've been uh, dealing with the, their, their flock of chickens for over 100 years. Um, 
And so I'm going to just kind of show you some examples here. Uh, I've got a cape. This is a bronze whiting cape. Now this looks like a normal grizzly cape until I turn it this way. And you can see that the fibers or the, the feathers on this are absolutely huge. These feathers down here are size 18 uh, ackles. And so again, this, this isn't a silver, it's not a gold, this is their bronze. So anyway, um, I'll, I'll kind of, you'll, you'll see us tie with these a lot, but. Yeah, that's a cape. I mean, that the fact that that's a cape is insane. Yeah, this is usually what other people's saddles, that's how long their saddles are. So anyway, that's the cape. Uh, this is good because it's got, you know, pretty long stuff. You can even do woolly buggers and streamers with this. You can do your, you know, big size eight parachute poppers with that stuff. Um, then I, I have this little guy. This is a quarter saddle. Now, this quarter saddle is pretty cool because it's in midge sizes. You see how long these fibers are? These, this midge saddle, the biggest feather on here is an 18. Everything on this, this whole thing is 18 and smaller. I've got some stuff on here. Uh, I don't know if you saw our post, but I tied a size 30 parachute atoms that is proportionate on this one. So very good stuff. If you tie a lot of midges, it's, it's recommended to get one of these. Um, but uh, my favorite piece of grizzly hackle to tie with is my new saddle. This is a bronze. I just barely got this. This is after the hair hackle craze. And so, again, I'll show you here. I mean, look how dense that thing is. Those are all, you know, some, like, 14s down to about size 20. So, very high-quality stuff. I mean, uh, the other thing about whiting hackle is you might pay, what, 60 bucks for this, for this saddle. And other companies should be able to get get a saddle for maybe you know thirty or forty bucks. But the the amount of usable hackle on the whiting hat on the whiting is so much more than any other brand. Like on one of these long feathers, I can do like four or five Griffiths nets. Um, with other saddles, you might get two out of a, a feather. So. In the long run, it's actually probably the cheapest hackle that there is. Um, anyway, I just kind of wanted to find <laughs> anything show off my, my hackle. What are you laughing at? Dog face. You put the dog face on me? I got a dog face, and then you lay that on me? All right. That's jacked up. That is Back to uh, back to reality. You think we can do an 18? I, I think we can. Because yeah. you get the bunny mid, you gotta have to. You gotta do it. Um, for anybody that's in the hangout or even on YouTube, I'm looking to see if there's questions. Uh, you know, does anybody have any questions right now? Good. <laughs> Excellent. All right. We're going to zoom in here. Okay. Focus. Can't trust these webcams to autofocus, that's for sure. Can't trust your mom to autofocus either. That's right. Okay. Okay, now we're going to tie the bunny midge. Um, kind of a cool story behind this one. Um, not necessarily cool, but it was definitely developed for a purpose. Um, in our rivers in Utah in the wintertime, you can catch fish on dry flies year-round. Uh, it just depends on how willing you are to fish the really small stuff. And so a friend of, of mine and I, we, we found some size 30 and 32 hooks. And so we started messing around, you know, we tied your 
typical zebra mid, we tied some other pupil patterns, and then we ended up um, tying some dry flies. But we wanted a dry fly that was tiny, that would float high with minimal materials, and that we could see most of all. Imagine fishing a, a size 30 dry fly and expecting to see it. So, you know, obviously we were keying in on, on pretty pretty flat water for this. But anyway, uh, the bunny midge was born, I think, one night in the fly tying dungeon. Um, and uh, it's, it's a pattern that, that can be tied proportionate down to 32. It doesn't use expensive materials like tackle. Uh, even though, like, the snowshoe rabbit foot is, is getting more and more difficult to find. Um, can, can you see that pretty good? Yeah. Okay. So the rabbit's foot, the snowshoe rabbit's foot, comes all like this. And the first time I, I started tying these, my wife was pregnant, and she looks at this thing and she's like, is that a dog's foot? <laughs> I'm like, no, it's a rabbit's foot. She said, okay. But then I started taking the toes and breaking them out, and the sound made her just leave the room. It was pretty nasty. So, note to uh, fly fish food followers, don't do this in front of a pregnant wife. It might make her a little bit queasy. And when you break them, they can sometimes smell something fierce. Oh, yeah. They do. They smell like uh, fungus fingernails. You don't have the dog face on me. Do you? Where's it? Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Okay, so without any further explanation, we'll just get started. I've got uh, Uni dot black thread, and uh, uh, I typically tie this on a Tiemco 2488. Um, I love my Allen hooks, but when it comes to the tiny, tiny stuff, I switch over to Tiemco or the new Gamakatsu uh, midge hooks because... Um, they seem to have better barbs on them, just tiny micro barbs. Uh, this one is actually a Mustad C49S, and as they get smaller, they have lighter wire, so you could fish this as a dry fly. Okay, the tail on this is going to be uh, midge flash. So midge flash, all it is, it's another type of crystal flash. It's just a lot thinner in diameter. And the reason I use this is because it has kind of some segmentation in it, so it looks like the shuck of a newly hatched midge. So I'm just going to tie this in. Wrap it back. And then kind of wrap up to the middle somewhere. Um, and then I'll trim it about equal to the length of the body. Or maybe a little bit shorter about like that. Again, I'm going to use the, the same iron gray thread to make the rib on this fly. And I'm going to use that same technique to flatten out the body with my uni thread. If you use UTC 70, um, or any UTC thread, it's automatically flat or flat. So anyway, I'm just going to go back down it. The other thing about midges is they don't have a tapered body like a mayfly. They're fat in the back all the way up to the head. Okay. So I left a little bit too much space here, so I'm just going to cover that in right about to to there. Um, and then I'll just take my my thread. Wrap that forward. Okay. Now we're ready to tie in the wing. So as you can see, this this again is a very simple pattern. You know, a lot of the stuff we post on our website is pretty elaborate. It's pretty you know, it's got a lot of advanced techniques in it. But really, a lot of the flies that we fish day in and day out are very simple patterns like this one. Okay, so as you can see, I've picked this rabbit foot clean. All the way basically where the palm would be. 
all the way up onto the toes. So see, this toe fiber is ideal for your bigger bunny midges. And as you tie the 30s, you're going to want to move down into this portion because it's a little bit finer. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clip off some, some fibers from the, the middle toe. doesn't matter what toe it is. Believe me, we'll have people that ask. <laughs> nice hat, Jerry. <laughs> What's Jerry wearing? He's got our Flappish Dude hat on. Oh, nice. Better than your hat. Oh, I represent Salt Lake City. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this uh, clump of, of uh, snowshoe, and I'm going to lay it on the bunny midge parallel to the hook. It's kind of hard to see because I use pinch techniques a lot when I tie stuff in. I'm going to just slide my fingers over the hook, bring the thread up between my fingers, and then pull it straight down. And I'm going to do three wraps, loose wraps for this. Now, without letting go of the back section of the wing, I'm going to take the front section and pull it toward me. And what that does is it creates... <laughs> oh, wow. What it does is it makes me screw up. Edit that part out. Edit that part out. Okay. So I'm going to pull the front section toward me. And now I'm going to take the thread and figure eight in between those two wings. Okay. And it's still tied in pretty loose. And as you can see, it's kind of like a spinner wing. Now the key is to pull those wings both vertical and make some make three or four tight wraps underneath those wings. And as you'll see, it kind of makes those wings drop up at an angle. It's kind of hard to see at this angle, but anyway, it does. On a bigger fly like this, I might add a touch of dubbing for the thorax. But as you can see, on the bottom of the fly, there's no bulk. There's no bulk at all um, right here on the bottom of the fly. So it makes for a, a really slim pattern. That's how you can get away time in the 30s with it. So now I'm just going to pull those wings back, create a little bit of a head, and whip finish while I'm holding that back. It's kind of takes some practice, but not too difficult. Turn that off. And now, to trim the wings to size, I'm just going to pull those straight up. See that? Pull those straight up and trim them about the length of the body. So, so essentially, that's the bunny midge. It's a very simple pattern. Um, if you can't find bunny, you can use uh, polypropylene yarn the wing even though it won't look quite as buggy um, but anyway this this fly has caught me a lot of fish uh, in the winter time I'm constantly busy tying bunny midges for people so um, very effective fly very simple and it, oh the other thing is when you take this snowshoe rabbit wing out onto the water you'll see that it's very translucent it gives off a lot of light so you'll be able to see it really well even in tiny sizes. Um, my favorite way to fish it though is I'll put the Peacock King on in front and trail the bunny midge behind it about 18 inches. So um, even on, on uh, a size 32, um, your 6x tippet will go through it. So you should never have to use anything smaller than 6x. Anyway, that's the bunny midge. What now, Curtis? Young. Young. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Well, he's getting that ready. A lot of you probably heard about the Young special. Um, I ran into the originator, Andy Kim, uh, a lot of years ago on the green. And uh, let me tell you, that guy's a fish magnet. Um, and a chick magnet. And a chick magnet. And his, his buddy Jerry, the camo man. Um, 
anyway, I mean, there's a lot of hype, I think, and a lot of, uh, it was a little bit of a, a divisive kind of situation, because a lot of people were, you know, swear by the pattern, and other people just uh, didn't take too kindly to it. You know, it's a good pattern. I think it's more a style of uh, fly, and that's why we like it. We're going to keep the uh, uh, the pattern alive here. You don't hear much uh, as much about it today, but you know, the time I did run into him, um, actually a couple times on the Green River in Utah, and uh, I mean, again, it was phenomenal how many fish the guy was catching. He had some really good technique, more akin to a Euro nymphing technique, whereas um, not so much a strike indicator, but just uh, pulling the uh, pattern in through the, 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 uh, the runs. And uh, these fish just gorge on midge larva and pupa, and that's what, what this is going to uh, imitate. So anyway, um, as uh, again, as we tie, I notice uh, some of you guys have got your vices up, uh, Nathan and uh, somebody else is on there a little bit. Um, again, at the end, if uh, if you, I know it's kind of hard to keep up with this, right? So, if uh, you want us to stop and we can take a look at what you've done or something, we can do that too. So, let me uh, readjust the camera here to get a little better angle. Okay. Okay. I had somebody ask me. What a couple weeks ago about uh, tying small flies on bigger hooks. And my answer is absolutely, as long as it's not a dry fly. Um, if you tie a dry fly, say this is a size 16 hook. Again, this is a an Allen N205 BL. Is that the model number? Yeah. Uh, it's it's their newest barbless hook, and it's it's awesome. It's a light wire hook. It's it's like the ultimate merger hook. Uh, but I'm going to tie this Young Special on it. Um, but anyway, when you tie smaller flies on bigger hooks, essentially it's just going to give you more hook gap. And you'll see what I mean when I tie this. Uh, but if you tie a, a tiny dry fly on a great hook, big hook, all that metal from the big hook is probably just going to seep. Okay, so the key to this fly is the Coates and Clark sewing thread. So this came straight from Curtis's mom's sewing kit, I think, right? Yeah, you bet. <laughs> anyway, uh, actually Hobby Lobby. It it doesn't necessarily matter what brand of sewing thread you get. It just needs to be that that thicker thread to make this work right. Uh, I've also done the Young Special out of um, rod building thread and also um, like the embroidery floss that you can get. The very first part of this is, is the most critical. Okay, So you're not going to dress your hook or anything. You're just going to start with this Coats and Clark. And so I'm going to start by wrapping right in the middle of the hook and going forward. Going forward four wraps. Okay. Now I'm going to take this and wrap back over it, and I've still got a, a hold on the tag end over those four wraps. Now the next two or three wraps are going to be over the tag end, and now I'm going to cut off the tag end and make a few more wraps. And as you can see, I'm, I'm, uh, or maybe you can't see, but I'm spinning the bobbin to flatten this thread out. So my last couple wraps will cover up that tag end. As, as you can see, it's a very nice, subtle little paper to this fly. Um, the next step now is to take your thread and twist it up clockwise. So I'm going to just twist my bobbin. And uh, as I learned earlier today, the rayon thread, um, if you twist it up too much, it'll break. So I'm going to try not to do that. After you've got it twisted up, um, what you're going to do now is you're just going to take that twisted thread and wrap that over the top of the body. Now see how it's a little bit fuzzy right there? I think that's part of the key of why this pattern fishes so well. For some reason the fish really like it. But I'm just going to take um, touching turns of wraps. Use a David Bell reference, touching turns. 
He's the man. And I'm going to wrap forward. And so now I'm, I've created my body of this midge. And it looks really good. Now, I could try to whip finish that, but because my thread is so wound up right now, it probably wouldn't whip finish very well. So I'm just going to wrap forward. The easiest way to transition to your black ADOP fly kind thread is to stop doing that. Wasn't I just trying not to do that? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to keep tension on here, and then I'm just going to take my fly tying thread, and I'm going to wrap over the top of it. quite a bit of room up by the eye. Again, I'm tying a, a smaller fly on a bigger hook. So that's about all I'm going to do for the head here. And then I'm just going to whip finish. That's basically it. That's the Yang Special. Uh, it's a dumb little fly. Um, we don't know why it works so well, but man, it, it sure hunts. A um, couple of modifications you can do to that is you can add some wings. There are like a couple of strands of crystal flash out the back. Or you can wrap part of the head with crystal flash. And my favorite, what I'm going to do, and uh, you guys have seen us do this a lot, but I'm going to use some clear tear goo um, and just lightly coat the head. I've got it on a, on a bodkin. And just kind of tag the head a little bit. That'll make a nice little bulbous head. And as I wait to cure it, I, I use my rotary vise to kind of form it into a more uniform circle. All right, we're done. All right, so that's the Young Special. I've also called it, or heard it called, the Thread Midge, or other terms which I can't use in a, on a family channel. Anyway, any any other info about the Young Special Curtis? No, it's a good one. Any of our Google Hangouts guys have any questions? Okay. I think now what I'm going to do is talk for about 15 or 20 minutes about hen hackle. <laughs> um, let's see. What's next? Well, he gets that ready. This, uh, this is another pattern that uh, is one of those that, uh, if you've read our blog, kind of comes out of uh, a result of some hard knocks learning. And I, I was fishing on the Green River, in Utah again. This is about Yong special time frame, probably about. Um, there's a guy fishing this midge hatch. I'd been fishing for about three hours. I caught one fish on Griffith's net in three hours. I was just fishing on top. And uh, in the end, I uh, I was pretty frustrated. And so this guy catches one and and releases it. Got one on the second cast and. I kind of was watching for a little bit, and he, he actually struck up a conversation. Was talking to me, and it turns out he was uh, local there in the Dutch John area, and his son was a guide and had fished what was really a um, a palomino midge, I think, of some sort. But the point was it, it was hanging vertically in the water surface of the water. So I went back and, and messed with that pattern and, and fished it a few times on a local river, and I did okay, and kind of refined it a few times over the next couple of weeks and I went back and same type of situation really heavy midge hatch and I mean I absolutely slaughtered the fish on this pattern uh, the ridiculous thing is it's so so simple I mean literally uh, two materials and you can tie a dozen of these in, in just a few minutes so um, probably my most effective midge pattern overall just in terms of 
finicky fish or whatever. It's it's an awesome pattern. So it's one of those, uh, and again, a lot of, uh, it's simple, but a lot of people have tied this and fished with it, and it's, it's done really well. So like, if we go down to a size 24 with this, or even smaller on up to 14s and 16s. So take it away, Cafe. All right. I'm looking at the updates. It looks like Tyler just joined us. It's Tyler Wilhelm, I think it is. I went to high school with him. So nice. not everybody from Bernal's a little Three redneck. Blanky. Right? Okay. Um, again, this is for demo purposes. I'm using the same size 16 N205 DL. My preferred hook for for this fly, as well as uh, I do a bunny version of this, and I think we might have enough time actually to do it. Um, but the bunny version of this fly is is uh, also tied on it, but I tie it on a, like a 2488, and I really like size 24 for this fly. It just seems to, to be just right. Um, okay, so I'm just going to start my thread. Um, and uh, you're really only going to wrap the first little section of, of the of the hook. You're not going to you know wrap very far back because this is going to kind of have an extended body type thing. Um, now, Airline has a cool product called Easy Magic Dub. It looks like this. It looks like a little a micro piece of chenille, and I really haven't found a super good use for it other than these Alamino style or Omerger style midges. But it makes for a super simple body. Um, so I'm just going to tie this in. I'm going to tie it in so it just goes a little bit past the hook shank. Now imagine that I'm tying this on a much smaller hook. Um, so you just adjust accordingly for size. So just use the pinch technique to wrap that in. Tie that in all the way and then just trim off my excess. Usually what I'll do is I'll take a lighter and just kind of singe it, but Curtis forgot his lighter and photo slacker. Yeah. So what I did is I just took my scissors and I trimmed it up so you can see it goes to a little bit of a point. What that does if you singe it or, or cut it like that is it helps that butt hang down in the surface and not float. Because again, we're, we're tying, as you'll see here, with some foam. So the idea is that foam sits in the surface film and that butt just hangs vertically. And it's an enticing morsel. Yep. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> we've used, a, we've tried a lot of different foam for this. And there is one foam that rules them all for this pattern specifically, and it's Rainy's episode foam. Uh, the reason being is, I don't know if you can see, but it kind of has a, a little bit of a sheen to it. So that's reason number one. Number two is it's a different consistency from craft foam. Uh, this Rainy's episode foam is, is kind of spongy, and it stays a lot more than craft foam in, in tiny amounts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just cut off maybe an eighth of an inch thick piece. How how thick is this? Is this the eighth inch? Um, that may be the quarter inch, actually. Might be the quarter. Okay. Regardless, you kind of have to trim it down. So I've got a little piece of foam, a little square of foam, and I don't know how. I mean, Curtis showed me this pattern, and so funny thing is, like, we'll show each other patterns, but it's not like we have to ask each other how to tie it. We just kind of do it our own way. So. He might do it a little different from me on this, but what I what I do is I'll I'll take the the, the jagged edges and I'll trim them off very first. You wait till after it's done to do that. Yeah, that way I can see the orientation with respect to the hook. You want that the when it floats, the biggest flat plane will be what's on the surface. So it so does I've, it doesn't matter. Except for my way is better course. <laughs> anyway, um, so I've kind of created a little bowl of foam, and I'm just going to take that and tie it in right here. And I'm 
I'm using a dot thread, so I can't really cinch down super tight on it. So as you see, I'm taking several wraps here. Okay. Now I'm going to tie it down in front as well. So that piece of foam is just going to kind of hang there. Now if I were to take my my uh, scissors and just lop that off right here, um, what would happen is I'd have a huge kind of tag end here. So because this foam's a little bit elastic, I'm just going to pull it, stick my scissor under there and trim it, and it will suck all the, the fibers back up in there, and then I should be able to come in with my thread and, and clean that all up. So on my patterns that I do for this, I do like to add a little tiny thorax of dubbing kind of underneath it to kind of give it more of a, a chunky appearance, kind of like the, the head of a chronomid. So I'm just going to take, again, this is for demonstration purposes only. I've got some little gray snowshoe fibers that I trimmed off of the foot, and I'll dub that on the thread. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of take that and figure eight under the fly a little bit. Now what I'm going to do is, is just come up and whip finish it. So as you can see, this is probably the ultimate in simplicity in midge patterns. But I'll tell you what, there are times where nothing else works. And this probably shouldn't be a last resort, but when you tie on the foam merger, start catching fish. Uh, now the way this works, like Curtis was saying, is the, the back of it's going to kind of hang down in the water. Like we were saying, midges hatch vertically and so as they as they hatch they're kind of swimming vertically up toward the surface so this fly everything down here will absorb water like the tail isn't very water repellent your dubbing will absorb a little bit of water but that foam will float like a cork so it'll float just like this in the, in the water um there was a time where i would take uh, like puff paint for crafting and take a little tiny white dab of it and put it right on the top here to make it a little bit more visible. But most of the time when I'm fishing a foam merger, it's like a size 24 and I'm fishing it behind like a Peacock King or a, a bigger dry trap. But anyway, for all intents and purposes, that is the foam merger. Yeah, I'll actually on that one, um, on the bigger sizes, I'll tie in a little post to be an indicator of uh, some polypropylene yarn or some McFly foam, McFly foam or McFly lawn, whatever it's called. And uh, I'll tie that either on the, between the foam and the eye of the hook there, situated straight out from the eye, because again, that should be how it's situated on the water, which is another indicator to you of how it's floating. If you're not seeing your indicator pop up like that, or the post, you know it uh, either needs some dressing. So floatant you want to put on the top of the foam and keep it away from anything else and it should sink fine and, and I actually had the pattern originally I tied a body and beans and crap like that and as I'm often known to do I'll strip things away until I can get it done to the bare minimum that was this you know even without dubbing uh, it works great so it's like Curtis's version of a bars emerger <laughs> One time we were fishing a run, and he was just pulling them out like crazy. And I asked him what he was using, and he said that he was using a bars emerger. Well, as soon as the day was over, I, I looked at his flies, and basically it was a hook with some olive dubbing on the back and some gray dubbing in the front. No tail, no wing case, nothing. And so I told him he couldn't call it a bars emerger anymore. He had to call it a dubbing emerger because... You know, he, he went through the elimination process with that one, I guess. And, you know, it still fished great, but eliminated all the 
fanciness out of it. Unnecessary. Unnecessary. Um, since we have it, we, we talk about this fly a lot on our site, um, the orange asher. And I don't even know why it works so well, but it is definitely a fish catcher, uh, especially here in Utah, we've got the, the Green River. It's a tailwater, comes out of Flaming Gorge Reservoir, very highly pressured fishery. Um, and uh, anyway, the, uh, the Green River is one of those rivers where you know, you could be fishing a, a bug one hour, and the next hour it's just not going to work. So the orange asher is one of those flies that you can fish on the green, and you're almost sure that you're going to catch catch some fish. So I want to show you that the orange asher, really it's a simple pattern, but I want to show you a way to make your, your midge clusters virtually indestructible uh, by using clear pure goo. So... Again, I'm using a, an Allen N103S, the straight eye hook, uh, and I've got some fluorescent orange UTC70. Now, you can use the burnt orange color, you can use you know all different shades of orange, but for some reason the orange color, or maybe a, an olive color with dun hackle, those have been our, our best producers. I'm just going to start the thread on the hook. Trim that up. And uh, to keep it fairly flat, I'm going to keep my thread untwisted. So you can see I've, I've laid down a pretty even body here. Now I'm going to take, now, and I'll tell you. I've been using the same piece of hackle. I still have about four inches of it left. And I've tied two midge clusters and one parachute that's pretty heavily hackled with one piece of hackle. So anyway, that's whiting for you. Um, so I'm going to prepare the stem. And again, just like when I tied the other cluster, I'm not going to tie it in so that the, the hackle is right here at the touching the thread. I'm going to tie it so that, that it's a little bit further back. And as you can see, if you don't, if you tie it in, it's not quite right. You can just pull and adjust it. So I'm going to take that and just wrap it forward now. You know, the body's not going to be completely, perfectly even, but pretty close. All right. So the orange asher, you would just wrap your hackle through it and call it good. But to make an indestructo asher, what I'm going to do is I'm going to coat the body with a little bit of clear cure goo first. And a little bit, little bit goes a, a long way. Let's see if I can get just a tiny bit on there. So... You can barely see the amount that I put on there. It starts to bubble in the middle. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a body of, of clear cure goo. Now I'm just going to take my hackle and wrap it through the goo. And just make one turn to tie that off. Now I'm going to take the light the UV light and cure it. Now, that hackle is glued to the shank of the hook. I mean, it is not going anywhere. Um, so, that fly is going to last you a long time. Now, you can use that technique on, you know, like anything that you're palm palmering hackle through, as long as it doesn't have a body of W. Um, Now that's the orange asher. Now on these clusters, 
I really don't tie them much smaller than uh, about an 18. If you're, if you're fishing clusters smaller than 18s, the fish are probably taking it as an individual fly. Uh, so, you know, the parachute or the bunny midge is maybe a better option. But 18s, I fished them like Curtis was saying. I fished these all the way up to like size 10 when there's a really strong midge hatch going on. And they seem to work really well. Um, another thing that you can do with this type of fly that I do quite a bit actually, is I'll take some holographic tinsel and make the body out of holographic tinsel, then do the third gear goo and then wrap the hackle through it. And uh, what that does is when, you know, you've seen the wing cases on some of the nymphs where the clear cure goo is over the tinsel, it really makes the flash pop quite a bit. So you can imagine how that would look on the body of this. But anyway, uh, there's really no wrong answer when you're tying midge clusters. Uh, it's pretty, it's like I was, I've, I've said before, there's really no, no rules to, to tying. So tie them in a bunch of different colors, sizes. Um, what we do here is pretty much just make suggestions. So anyway, that's the orange jacket. Okay. Don't look like there's any questions. About getting to the end of things. Um, and, you know, we, we scheduled this for two hours because we, we weren't quite sure how it was going to go. It's the first time we've done something like this. So, uh, if, you know, we're, as, we, as we get along doing this more, we'll probably have a better idea of how long they will take. So, anyway. Any questions, at least the uh, guys on the Google Hangouts? Uh, I think most of you should be unmuted. Uh, Jerry asks, what do we use for a video camera? Um, it's a uh, Logitech cam webcam. And uh, I don't know the model offhand. The challenge there is it's got to be uh, really, really close to your fly, which makes it hard to tie with it there in front of you, but uh, that's what we use for this. For our videos, we use uh, some pretty high quality HD with macro lens video camera for our YouTube channel. Yeah, so there, there was a little bit of trial and error with them. We, we went through several different cameras. And lighting. Before we finally found something that, that we like, but yeah, the key is probably lighting more than anything. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions on our YouTube. Again, that one's a little tough because it's uh, view only. And uh, yeah, but we it should be good. We just want to tell you all thanks. We uh, we've been at Fly Fish Food. We've been at it for about a year now. And uh, we we kind of started it up just you know we. We we're always getting emails, you know, how do you do this, how do you do that, and, uh, you know, it got to the point where we just decided it could make a blog, so we appreciate all your followers, and uh, keep up the contributions and the comments, and if you want us to do anything else, just let us know. Uh, we're open to suggestions on what the next session should be. Um, I think Jerry has a question. Jerry, I think you should be able to talk. Let me make sure here. Yeah, your mic is open if you want to talk, Jerry. Hi. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Oh. Well, thanks a whole bunch for doing this. This is great. Yeah, no problem. Huh. I guess we could take this off the, the Zoom. Well, Jerry's on now. Oh, Jerry's on? Well, I'll switch it back to me. So this is my training room. <laughs> Break my camera. <laughs> any other questions, guys? Okay, we'll go ahead and log off. Uh, if you have any suggestions or anything, let us know. Thanks, Otherwise, guys. we'll uh, go ahead and end right now. And you guys have a good evening. Thanks for joining. See you next time. All right.